Welcome to The Cop and the Shrink, a podcast exploring mental health, law enforcement, and societal issues from the perspective of a police officer and a mental health professional. Have questions about current events, social media, mental health, or police matter? Visit thecopandtheshrink.com. Let's get this episode started with your hosts, Harold Bozeman and Dennis Carradine. And we are back for episode three. Welcome to the Cop and the Shrink. Um, it's reverse. I'm the Shrink. I'm the Cop. I'm the Cop. And we, and we actually have another cop with us today. So we'll get to our special guest here shortly. Uh, but we want you to, well, first of all, thank you for listening. Uh, again, uh, the viewership is kind of interesting. You know, you go back and you look at the analytics and you start seeing where people are listening to this podcast. And they love us in Scandinavia. It's amazing. No kidding. I don't think anybody listens to us in Delaware or Pennsylvania, but Scandinavia loves us. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and as you could see, if you are vi- if you're watching the video on YouTube, which would be youtube.com slash the cop and the shrink, uh, we have a new background. We, uh, we decided we were going to go way patriotic. We have the old girl uh, behind us. Lovely. I like it. It only took us three tries before somebody fell off the uh, chair to, to put it up there, but we're all good with this. So anyway, so anyway, so we're here. Make sure you listen at thecopandtheshrink.com. Go check us out on the web. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Anchor uh, Podcast. Uh, we're also on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and anywhere that podcasting can be listening to. So I am going to allow the cop, the first cop, to introduce the second cop. All right. So for, for, for our September 12th podcast, we have with us a guest, Tyler Giles, who's going to talk to us about some of his experiences as a police officer, especially some of his experiences of late. Of late. Of late. So Tyler, tell us or tell the viewers a little bit about you because, Tyler, you come from, and I, I, I joked about it earlier, but you basically come from first responder royalty in the state of Delaware. <laughs> a, a lot of people say that. We have a joke in the family. You're either first responder or you're on the other side there's no in in the middle with our family you're so they're, they're a cop a fireman or something a little bit else <laughs> oh <laughs> well give it give us a little bit of your background tell us uh, that because obviously uh we want to get into the story of of one of the reasons that you're here but give us your background tell us about you um i've been employed as a uh, police officer in the state of delaware for i believe about seven years now um as you said, I come from a family whose majority is either uh, firefighters, cops. Uh, they work in the EMS field. They do something along those <laughs> along those sides. Um, Collectively own the city of Ellesmere <laughs> in Delaware is what the it town, is. The town. The yes. town of Ellesmere. <laughs> yes. Uh, we, we do a lot for um, not me specifically, but um, my aunt, uncle, uh, my cousin, they all work for Ellesmere doing something. They, they're not working there. They're volunteering at the firehouse. Um, I spent a lot of time in Ellesmere. I was a volunteer firefighter uh, with them. I still am. I've been uh, with Ellesmere for, I, I want to say, about 14 years now. I nice. uh, joined when I was uh, 15. Um, I lived, I grew up in the uh, city of Wilmington in Little Italy, so my parents kind of got me into that to keep me out of trouble. So it, would, it definitely worked <laughs> when I wasn't, you know, home or at school i was at the firehouse kind of or you would have landed on the other side of the clan correct <laughs> <laughs> no drug running nothing no like, yeah nothing, nothing crazy like that, like that. <laughs> <laughs> what did you so obviously as it's a family biz and we see that a lot with police officers we see it a ton with firefighters when did you get that bug in your head when did you think i want to be a police officer i want to protect and serve uh it's a little so it's a it's a the police thing kind of came as I got older. When I was younger, because my dad, my dad was a uh, Ellesmere volunteer firefighter, so um, he's disabled now. But I just grew up with my uncles talking about you know the fire department stuff like that. So I initially was looking into doing that, and um, one day I I didn't I uh, graduated high school. I went to AI uh, Lexus I Dupont high, or high school uh, near Greenville, and I graduated. I didn't I didn't go to college. Uh, School was never really for me, um, and I, I worked actually with my uncle 
uh, at Angersteins, which is also another Ellesmere <laughs> type of <laughs> business. That is, Angersteins have yeah. been there since Ellesmere was founded Forever. By, <laughs> by the Dutch, I think. <laughs> so I was, I was probably in my uh, 20s. It was right before I was 21, and I, I wanted to make more money. Sure. Um, my parents didn't have money to send me to college or anything else like that, so I figured I'd go into the military. Um, I went into the Marine Corps, just reserves, and uh, I did that because I, at that time I wanted to become a police officer. I saw my cousin. Uh, he went in with Ellesmere. I, I'm going to say he has five years on before, the, before I got hired with uh, another department. And uh, I just heard all his stories. And it, it made me want to do what he was doing. Okay. So, so, I so went the buzz the, came yeah, the pretty buzz, much late. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. When when you, because uh, obviously we always look at that, always name and reputation always precedes us. Right. So you were carrying this name and reputation of a family, yeah. not just yours, yeah. of a family into into the police department. Right. And two, two police chiefs, a police officer. Right. <laughs> How was that? How did, when you got in, did they just like focus on you and say, I, okay, here's this guy? <laughs> I, I hid under the radar a little bit and then they started find, like figuring out who I was in the academy. So I got, <laughs> I got a little bit of slack, but nothing, nothing crazy. Okay. Uh, I was just worrying about making a bad name for my family. I, I mean, obviously, because <laughs> we know as small as Delaware is, everybody, everybody hears every single story oh my god you know it's not even you know how they always say the the six degrees of kevin bacon right it you know in this area it's like the two degrees of giles right Right. so 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 you've been an officer seven years and and i know somebody sitting next to you probably had said at one point especially in the academy or somewhere along the line that there may be the potentiation that you would get fired upon Yes. That at some level, somebody might have aggression towards you in this. Right. And so recently, something had happened. Correct. And and that realization came true. Yes. And okay. um, it's uh, it's a little bit crazy because I I heard this from multiple people. Everybody what he says, well, you, it's never going to happen to you. I mean, and we think. I mean, we think about. I especially me. That's always in the back of your head or your mind when you're working. Um. You, I don't. I never thought it was going to be me, but you're always thinking about it. You're always trying to prevent that from happening, and then. And and, and let's be honest. In, in in that agency, it had been between between officers being shot. It had been 18 years between, you know, the, a shooting in the early 90s and the next officer who was hit. It, it was 18 years, and then from his to yours was like eight years. Right. So and so you're not when when there's that big a gap, right? When it hasn't happened in that long. Everybody's going and thinking this, this this doesn't happen anymore. At least this doesn't happen around here right. anymore. And and so, but but you did find yourself at the other end of that. You found yourself in that situation. So how? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, I was dispatched to a uh, routine call. Um, I I'm actually an FTO with my department, so I I had a rookie with me. And like I said, it, it was a routine call, something that um, we go to almost, if not daily, three to four times, you know, a night or a shift. So it's nothing. And um, during that, during our investigation, it ended up uh, turning into a domestic, which again, we ha- we go to, I would say, four or five times a night we're handling, you know, a, a domestic or something in that um, realm. So for um, people, and, and, and sorry for jumping no, in, okay. but for people that don't understand domestic, Give a garden variety domestic. Um, just what would an be argument, a call that you go uh, with? An, an argument, whether it's verbally or physically, between a romantic couple. Okay. Um, and especially now with you know COVID going on, everybody's stuck inside. It's kind of picked up a little bit. Yep. Um, so it turned into a, a domestic incident, and uh, during the investigation, um, uh, the suspect uh, fired at uh, me and a couple other officers. And I was struck along with two other officers. And to point a note, you were struck in the arm. Uh, I was struck in my left arm. Um, it went in uh, sideways. Um, and it, I broke uh, two bones in my shoulder. And surgery since? Yes. Uh, surgery uh, was to remove the bullet. So I got uh, struck with a 40 uh, millimeter uh, round, handgun round. 
which isn't a small one. No, it's pretty big. I I, I got to see I got to see uh, a picture of it, and it's 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 bigger than I thought it was. And the the average it, it, the average person kind of understands the the sizes of it. Nine millimeters, what most people think of when they think of a handgun. Right. A forty, much larger. Yes. So when you got hit, you got hit pretty hard. Right. Yes. And 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 we had pointed out where you got hit was interesting as well. Right. Because you have a tattoo. I do. I have a uh, St. Florian tattoo, and uh, he holds a cross, and he got hit right in the cross, and which is crazy. It, it's and it's I, wild. And um, I also got hit in the patch of my uniform, and we're taught that's one of the deadliest you know, um, places to get hit, uh, it's a, a, even in the military. Right. You know, um, a lot of the people who um, – people aim for that patch. If, if, if they know what they're doing, they aim for it because it's – it's a target. It's 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 a lethal target, and primarily because if it goes through the arm, it goes into the chest. Correct. Goes through the lungs, hits the heart, and all right. that. And thank God, thank, and and literally, I don't want to say the Saint Florian, obviously right. the patron saint of firefighters, protected you there, but my God, you know something did. Somebody did. Somebody somebody was there. Either that, that or I just drank a lot of milk when I was a kid because the bone stopped it. So, <laughs> so not getting too deep into the weeds about. The incident of the investigation, obviously, I, I just wanted you to come in here and talk about your experience with it, like like the immediate things that you started to think, the immediate things that went through your head, and then kind of how it progressed for the next several days and the next several weeks. The the One of the first things I remember after being sh- uh, shot was disbelief. Um, I was shot. I didn't, I felt, I thought it was a firework. And then I started feeling pain. Uh, to me, the best way I explain it is it it felt like I got hit with a sledgehammer in my arm. So I heard of, I, I think at one point I even said, who has fireworks? And I look, I start feeling the pain in my arm. I look down at my arm and start seeing the blood. So I realize I'm shot. Okay. So at, it was one of the first things was dis, disbelief. And then it turned into anger because sure. um, I was just pissed off. Uh, besides, uh, you know, my lieutenants and my supervisors, um, they're with me. I was one of the senior, senior guys on that floor. So, um, I made a decision that I, I thought, uh, may have contributed to it. Um, so that, that was one of the things that I was dealing with too, uh, right after I got shot. Mm. Cause I was, you know, instructing our younger officers, um, or newer officers, uh, what to do or what we were going to do. And it split, it split decisions. So. It, it was, and, and that, that thought was less than probably 10 seconds. It was disbelief, anger, l- regret, and then it was, okay, kind of like focused back, and then we took care of business. So tell them a little bit more about regret. What was the, were you, did you feel regret that you got shot or regret? I did, my regret was my decision. So not going into too many details, but um, we had to uh, force entry. Uh, into the front door of, of a residence. And uh, that was my decision. Okay. Um, and when, as soon as the door, um, as, soon as, as soon as we forced the door, we were, we were shot. And I say we because um, two other officers were hit. So I was hit first. Um, another officer was hit uh, second, twice in his leg. And then uh, another officer was actually on outside the residence and was struck once. Okay. So it was... It was um, me almost like Monday morning quarterbacking myself. Sure. So not not delving into whether those feelings are right or wrong. I, I've heard that from a number of officers involved in similar incidents that they you know that their concern was after they had time to slow down and think about it, the thoughts returned to did the decisions I make or did the decisions I made that night contribute to what occurred? Like if if I decided something different, if I'd made a different move, if I'd sent somebody to a different place would things have unfolded differently? Could we have avoided this? I've heard that a lot. And so it's not it's not unusual or uncommon for you to be feeling like, you know, you said you made the call. Right. And did the call you make cause that, put people right. in danger? That's, I mean, we've heard that quite a lot. And it, like Dennis said, the, the answer is all of your decisions are 50% chance. Correct. Right? Yep. So it, we don't know. We don't know if, if a different decision would have ended up with a different outcome. Right. You know, the... The, the suspect was, uh, we know he was still armed. Mm-hmm. We don't know whether he would have decided to shoot anyway, right. whether he would breach that door or not. So. Correct. And, and I mean, 
uh, talking to uh, you know the the uh, the other boys, they've they've kind of talked me through it too. And I and speak or thinking now about it, I, there's with the information I had, I don't think I would change any of my decisions. Sure. And that and that took a while. That that I think that 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 bothered me for a while. I didn't, I didn't being shot didn't really you know, I guess affect me too much. It was just my decision making. And now, you know, I've been able to get through that. And, and I think that's an important part about of, of you returning to work. Right. I think that's an important step to take for you to get back in the game because you don't want to come back and think about every decision you make. Is this right or wrong? You right. just want to make a decision right. that you think is right in the moment and go with it. If you start overthinking, if you start hesitating, right. you can still end up with bad results. Correct. So so getting over that hump, like you said, you know, with, with the help of talking to the boys and kind of working through it on your own, Getting over that hump is is an important part of your recovery, and it's an important part of your return to work, because you want to be able to come back, train your rookie partners, make the decisions on the street that have right. to be made, and and we we make these decisions in a split second all the time. I mean, if you think about how many decisions we've made, right, you know, one one decision you think went the wrong way, and you don't even know if that was wrong, right, but out of all the decisions you made, this is the only one you're second guessing, right. So you really can't get you really can't get yourself into the rut of hesitating when it's time to make a decision. So it, it's important that you got yourself to that point and that you realize that decisions just have to be made. Right. And I don't I don't think I honestly uh, would without talking to somebody. Um, you know, we have the SISM program that we work with, which was great. I all you know I grew up in the first responder family, so you know, uh, ten years ago, you know, SISM a lot of people didn't use it. Or they, or they thought it wasn't useful, it was, you know, almost like going in and talking about your feelings. But when we went in, we, we talked, it was literally us having a conversation and just talking about things that we hadn't had, the, hadn't had a chance to in a setting that was comfortable or that, um, you know, we could speak freely. Yeah. And without, without doing that, I don't think uh, I would be able to get over that. And, and so for the so the people listening that don't know the the SISM program that Tyler refers to is is CISM it's the critical incident stress management it's it's largely used by first responders and it's it's a form of peer support um, and sort of group stress debriefing that that they've found kind of helps helps get through the coping process and helps restore everybody to normal functioning we may or may not know something about that <laughs> <laughs> well my group cohesiveness has always been a big part you know we and, and we joked about the fop and by calling each right. other brother right <laughs> you know but the brotherhood is 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 one of those where they're going to support you but they're going to break your balls as well right and, and my assumption is is that during the support process the balls have probably been been broken a yeah. lot too yeah what what's the i and, and not to say but what's the funniest you've heard I don't want to go into tragic because obviously people could throw some tragic. I, I can't. I can't even remember to be honest. <laughs> I've, been, I've been calling him the dodgeball third yeah. runner up. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, dodgeball championship third runner up. Is yeah, <laughs> with a duck dodge. Yeah. You, know, dive. you can dodge a wrench. You can dodge a ball. <laughs> but again, but again, I think it's you know the brotherhood is very very important with that, or at least the fraternal aspect of it, and and that includes because we're it's September twelfth when we're recording this. It's also National Police Woman Day. So give it out to the ladies out there that in law enforcement. But without that, and I guess more of that that camaraderie, and you were talking about talking to the other guys, obviously the SISM program and so forth, do you think that this would have settled differently? And I know I, we're just kind of speculating at this point, but right. do you think that if somebody were to be in your position and they didn't utilize a SISM team, they didn't utilize the people around them, do you think – somebody might think differently so i've been i've been actually thinking about this question a lot myself too um you know if someone because there there still are police or people who don't you know necessarily trust or believe in cism for whatever reason i I don't under i don't understand why but if you're involved in a critical incident and you're not talking to anyone at all if you're holding it in and you're not, you know, communicating with your wife or, you know, a close friend or somebody you trust or your, you know, uh, your friends at work or something like that. It's there's I don't my my belief is it's it's not it can't it's, it's not healthy because you just would without without me talking to um, people, I, I don't think I would have been able to get over my decision because, you know, um, we judge ourselves more than anybody else. 
and hearing it from, you know, e- even people that you respect who have more time on the job than you and stuff like that and hearing them uh, say you did a good job or, or or your decision was the correct one or, you know, just, just, just hearing that, uh, it, it helps out your um, your mental thinking right. so much. And it, it's also, and I don't want, you know, and clearly I can't Monday morning quarterback. That's not what I would ever do. Um, but have you had people maybe come up to you and tell you what they would do? Like basically somebody saying like, well, if I was you, and if they did that, how did that ultimately factor into the healing process? I haven't had anybody um, state that in a way. I've had uh, one um, interaction with a person, and it wasn't the best. Um, not to go into details, it was. It wasn't really about you know the incident or something like that. It, um, but that 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 affected me. And I've talked to. I mean, the, after I was shot, I mean, my I had like five hundred text messages on my phone like I've talked to you know just people who were checking up on me and that out of 500 interactions I've had one bad and 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 it does affect you I you know it's like well you know what maybe he's right and these other people are like lying to me to make me feel good chances are that's not the case when right it's 499 to one yeah <laughs> <laughs> um it's we don't important like to that note, guy though, anyway <laughs> it's, it's important to note that what like you were saying like even even absent a formal program like cism you said you did a lot of your after action debriefing so to speak with with the group of guys that were affected the same as you yes the same incident as you yes and so even if people don't have access or don't know how to access a formal program, it's it's important to note that, you know, you guys can in- informally support one another. 100%. And, and the three of you have done a fantastic job at that. I'm yeah. Sure. So. We were close, uh, but we're like best friends now. I don't... <laughs> well, you, you you basically all got a Dakota ring for right. a very, very special group. That's, right. You know, well, well, you look at it statistically before we wrap this section up, statistically... Over 95% of police officers, over 95% in any given year, do not fire their weapons. Right. Let alone pull them out for any other reason. They have the non-lethal means. Here was a situation where you were shot, which puts you into, I think it's less than 2% of all the officers out of 1.3 million officers in the United States. Right. So you were in this... Very special category. You you are now top of the top of the class. <laughs> <laughs> you know you're put into this very special category, and those are the guys that are going to know, the ones that right. that are with you. The two other gentlemen, they're going to know how you feel. Where other people, and, and you know, and including a mental health ther- therapist, will be able to help. Will be able to talk through it. But in all truth, unless you were shot, you right. don't know. Right. Right. And um, I don't want, I don't want to take too much uh, out of this section but i uh i had uh somebody come over who was close to me who's been in an incident kind of like this and uh you know we we talk very you know bluntly to to each other we're not not um we're not trying to make each other feel good and he he sat with me because it was great uh you know when we got released from the hospital we had a motorcade from the hospital which is amazing i i got a i was telling reading online and somebody thought Biden was in town when i was leaving the hospital (laughs) My Just neighborhood, Giles. <laughs> my neighborhood showed out. There was cards on on my house. Everything, you know, it, nice. it, it was absolutely amazing. And probably two weeks later, this, you know, my friend came over and he was like, you know, this is great. He was like, but a month from now, this is gonna stop. Yeah. He was like, you know, it's it's great now that people are recognizing this and you know bringing you food because every night somebody, either a neighbor or a fellow cop, somebody was was just making me and my wife Kayla dinners. I had so much spaghetti. I can't believe I don't look like Tony Soprano right now. Um, and, and he sat down with me and he was like, you know, this is going to stop. Right. And this is all going to end. He was like, you know, in a month when all this settles down and everything like that, you know, just make sure that's that's really when everything starts to kind of like settle in and you have time by yourself because there's not 100 people in your in and out of your house every day where you have time by yourself and just, just make sure you're, you know, mentally okay You're squared away yeah, yeah. and yeah. It, to a t that 100 percent <laughs> happened it was like a month later um yeah. you know people stopped coming over and stuff like that and all that stuff's fine but it was like i can't you know i figured that was going to happen right. but just just having him sit down and just you know just confirming it almost and it was 
that that helped me out immensely too. Well, I know we could cook you more spaghetti. I, mean, <laughs> I, I know we could do this. I bought Denny, our, our producer here, my son. I bought him more spaghetti and he knows what to do with. So <laughs> we'll cook some of that. So again, we're going to, this is, uh, we're wrapping up this section, but we're going to come back. Uh, Tyler's going to stay with us. He's going to be here because we want to talk a little bit more about him and about family response. He brought up his lovely wife, Kayla, who who I think is part of the healing process as well and also part of this incident. And we, we need to talk about how family plays a role in this. So again, this is uh, police officer Tyler Giles. You're listening to The Cop and the Shrink. Remember to go to the Cop and the Shrink dot com uh, for future episodes. But again, uh, we will uh, be back. Thanks for listening. The Division of Wellness Services of the National Fraternal Order of Police is committed to leading the efforts to ensure the well-being of law enforcement officers. The FOP intends to no longer react to issues of critical stress affecting its members, but instead take a pre-act approach that is driven by trained peer support, research, empowerment of officers, awareness and stigma reduction, connections to service, and ongoing training and development. Information about the Wellness Division, resources, and publications can be found at fop.net front slash officer wellness. Donations to the National FOP in support of their Division of Wellness Services and other programs can be made online at nfop.firstresponderprocessing.com. All right. All right. Well, welcome back. Uh, this is The Cop and the Shrink. Remember to go to the Cop and the Shrink dot com and check out the episodes weekly here uh again we are with police officer tyler giles and we are also um the cop in the shrink the cop in the shrink makes sense and so tyler was talking about his personal uh experience with uh with a shooting incident and and before we go on to family and and so forth number one you know thank you thank you a for for being here i mean obviously Having a situation like this, I think police go one of two ways, and and you guys can tell me if I'm wrong with this, but I think I might I might be a little bit of an authority with this. <laughs> either either police go very very quiet about this incident where they don't discuss it at all, or they go not loudly about it, but they want to discuss it to kind of help other police. I don't think there's any in betweens, and I could be wrong. You guys tell me if I'm wrong with that, but I don't think there's any in betweens. I would uh, have to agree Um, because it's crazy now because any – even if I had an interaction with somebody once, they think they can – you know, and it sounds rude of me, but they think they can just come up and ask about the incident. And I'm like – I, you know, politely tell them, well, I don't want to talk about it. But I think if we don't talk about it to people that we trust or, you know – um, at least other first responders, we're just not going to know. I've, I've, you know, in my short time, I've, I've dealt with a PTSD, not me personally, but through friends and stuff like that. And it first started when I was in the Marine Corps. Um, and then I lost a really good friend of mine from PTSD. And now just after I was shot, just, just realizing the signs of other people sure. who have been tr- through traumatic incidents who really haven't talked to anybody. So I think without talking, you know, about it to at least other first responders, um, we're not going to know how to, you know, help each other out. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm on the fence. It's weird because I don't talk about it a lot. Um, you know, I don't even think, you know, my wife has heard the full story yet. Sure. Um, but I, I want people to, you know, reach out and know that somebody that you can trust, you know, it's just not to keep it all bottled up inside. I, you know, and it's, it's funny you say that because obviously being be an advocate for talk therapy, being an advocate for going through that. And when I say funny, not funny, ha ha, obviously <laughs> funny, I, I, ironic because the old adage, you know, and we've said this in other podcasts, we've said this in trainings, we've said this over literally over two decades of experience with this, that the person that's talking, we're not necessarily worried about. It's the person not talking that we're worried about. Right. And and that person holds it in. They hold it in. And, and sadly, that's where you start seeing those incidents. You know, and, and we, we do talk about suicide. We do talk about somebody being psychologically disengaged from their lives because of PTSD, because of, of trauma. So, you know, right. you are saying the right things, right? <laughs> you know, you're saying, hey, get right. out there and talk to somebody. Right. Somebody, I mean, 
just somebody you trust. Because uh, somebody, somebody else, so um, my, my buddy in the Marine Corps, uh, he wouldn't talk about it to another Marine. I, I, you know, I've had the conversation, you know, with him. I told him I was a reservist. So active duty Marines, reserve Marines, you know, it's, it's a totally different world. Still Marines. And I'm like, you, you know, a guy who is like a, you know, a grunt in the army. Mm -hmm. And he's like, he's not a Marine. I'm not going to talk to him about this stuff. And it's, and it's kind of like that too, about, you know, um, firefighters, they're, they're, they're not going to talk about it, a critical incident to like a police officer and a right. cop. I don't think a cop would to somebody else. Right. And it's crazy now because everybody know we're, we're very, I think the public is very, um, at least has an idea of what PTSD is. And the things, the thing that bothers me the most is, and I tell, I tell people this all the time, I'll have somebody come up to me and they're like, Oh, Hey, how are you after everything? I'm like, I'm fine. And they stare and then they stand there and they stare at me and they're like, well, no, but how are you? I'm like, I'm fine. And then they're like, no, but seriously, if you need to say anything, I'm like, thank you. But with all due respect, if I was having these, you would know, yeah. but I, I'm fine. Just Thanks. Like, you know, I've okay. had the right talks with the right right. People. Have you had thank any you. PTSD flare-ups? Is what they're right. saying. Yeah, you know? they're and, and they're trying to like post old Tyler. Right. Is what they're saying. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's happened to me so often. It's just I, I make a, a joke out of it sure. now. But and you're right. Some people don't talk. Some people don't open up about them. We we talked in one of our earlier episodes about our friend Charlie from FDNY. Right. He said he went through his entire career and told his wife every day the same thing. It's fine. I did nothing. Right. And then when he retired and had nothing to do but spend time with his wife, it all started to spill out. Like all of his years of trauma kind of crept up on him. Right. And it all just spilled out. Like he had never appropriately dealt with it. So. Right. I mean, you're we're we're in an age now where the, the resources are available to you and to people who experience things similar to yours, where they they can get out and they can Absolutely. they can talk through these things and they Absolutely. can. Absolutely. You know they have the resources and the, and the and the help available to them. So, but uh, there's there's also the porcelain doll theory, right? You know, porcelain doll theory says, okay, Tyler was just shot, shot on duty. So let's put him up in this cabinet, and and let's look at him. Right. It, you know, let's say, oh look, you know, there he is. But let's not ask the burning question. So when somebody says, you okay, and they try to give you an odd guy nod, right? right. You okay? Yeah. You, you okay, buddy? It's almost saying that we don't want to break you because if I ask right. you if you're okay, for some reason that's going to screw you completely up, right? Right. right. I know? mean, and it, it's great too, like knowing like other officers who have been through the same thing. I, you know, I, uh, I have a uh, officer who's on our platoon who was the last officer who was, you know, uh, shot on duty, <laughs> and uh, thankfully, uh, you know, I'm very good friends with him, and I, uh, he's he's been a great resource to like reach out to. And just just talk because we you know we went it's not the same thing but we were both shot so we can both go through it's almost like bouncing things off one another oh well I, the, you know the, I'm dealing with this or I'm dealing with that or I dealt with this and so I got over that so that's even great just at least having somebody to trust to talk about something right is amazing it gets you, it gets you off that shelf you're yeah not, you know it's it's yeah. saying that you're not going to break apart if somebody actually talks to you about right. this so that brings us to a question. How's the wife doing with it? <laughs> because let, let's put it this way, you know, she she's a part of this. She's she married into not only not only you as a, as a police officer. She married into a family of first right. responders. Right. And and you know we've contended a million times that you know this isn't that you knew what the job was going to be like. You knew what you were signing up for. Like right. We we really never. We, we, we don't believe that. That's not that. Mm -hmm. you know, she married Tyler, but you were a police officer. Right. Okay. Um, How was she through this? I'm not, I'm not just saying this because she's listening or, or, or she'll be listening to this, um, you know, segment, but she's been amazing. I mean, she, uh, that was one of the other thoughts I had after I was shot too was, you know, um, how's Kayla going to take this? Right. And I, you know, I, I, um, she, I think she. I think she was like second trimester. She's pregnant now. We're doing nine nine weeks. So. Congratulations. Um, Congratulations! So she was pregnant. So I was worried about that because I I don't know a lot about pregnancy, but I'm like she gets so stressed out. Is she gonna have like a mid like how does this work? So I just remember you know as um, the medics and you know uh, the fire department got there. Um, her dad works um, in the in, with the fire department, so I had them. Um, Pretty much call call him, okay. and I remember telling them, you know, call call Caesar, her dad, her dad's Eric Haley, 
Okay. And they call him Caesar. And, and I was like, call Caesar, tell, tell him to go pick up Kayla. And she did. And um, unfortunately, before she, before Caesar got a hold of her, my dad called. And I, I to this day, I have no idea how he found out. So quick. Because... <laughs> Giles was shot in Delaware. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That it, second degree, it's right? It's news. Because I, before we left, I had, because I, I knew one of the... Um, the firefighters on scene uh, very well. He's one of my great friends. And I had, I, you know, I told him, I'm like, I need you to call Caesar and have him pick up Kayla and bring him to the hospital. And she's like, okay. Or he said, okay. And then before he could even call her anything, my dad's on the phone and she, she said she picks up and he's like, um, Tyler shot, is he okay? And that's exactly how she found out. <laughs> and she was a little angry after that uh, from, you know, at my dad for a little bit, but it's, I had to, you know, explain to her, how is he supposed to know that we don't know? Right. You know, he's probably freaking out just as much as you are right, right now. Um, because with him being d- disabled, he's completely out of everything. He's out of loop with everything. Right. Um, so that's that's how she found out. So she, she took that a little hard. Um, also, with you know, with uh, with COVID, when we were there, because uh, we got I got admitted to the hospital. And when we were there, the hospital would not let her stay the night. Oh. And that, that was a major factor. I remember almost arguing with her in, in the hospital room. Sure. And, sure. Um, and the hospital was amazing. Everybody there uh, was absolutely amazing. I, I really have nothing negative to say about anything um, about the hospital staff. And I kind of had to explain to her that it's the policy. It's not, it's not the nurse down in the... ER who hates us who's right. not letting you upstairs it's she gets in trouble if she lets you if she lets you up there you, you can't help it but this is also pregnant wife husband just right. shot right I, I, I there's probably I literally there's probably not a, a more <laughs> angry person yeah. at that point <laughs> that you're going to say by the way you can't go see your right. husband you know well and she was able to see me but her not being able to spend the night with me right uh was just i i, I think it you know almost like broke her a little bit oh and um my my other uh buddy who was shot he his wife went through the same thing wow and they were just like there's nothing we can do you guys can't go up there and then of course you know there was other officers and they're like well they can go up there and we're like it's a security reason like <laughs> I, it's like I'm shot, and I have to explain this all to you because you're freaking out, and rightfully so. I mean, I I get I get both sides of the spectrum there, but I just I, I had to walk her through that, and then it was you know um, irritating because I had to get somebody to spend the night at the house with her because if she wasn't gonna she was going home, I yeah, yeah. I don't want her staying at the house by herself. So thankfully, her mom and then her uh, Caesar stayed, so that was great. She went through that, and then you know she's she's honestly a gangster. I mean, she's she's had she, she's she's taken this pregnancy amazing. There's I told her the other day I was like, there's times that you've taken care of me that I even forget you're pregnant because she you know I wasn't able to shower by myself. She was changing out my my, uh, my diaper my diaper. She was changing you know my cleaning my wound every day. Um, her mom uh, runs a trauma unit for uh, Bloomington, so she we ask her all, tons of questions, and she kind of mm-hmm. gave her like. Okay, this is what you do, and Kayla took care of that, and Great. just on the men. But um, she's been okay. She's been good. So I think talking about her family a little bit is important because she she wasn't um, completely sheltered yeah. from from right, this right, world, right? right? She has her dad. You said obviously Caesar's involved in the fire service. She's got an uncle who's been a big name in the fire service since the early nineties, right? Uh, all over Newcastle County. Yeah. Um, so and she's got you know she's got family. Her mom's in emergency medicine, so she's part of our world, right? She's so she was probably a little better prepared for this than than a spouse who worked completely in banking or completely right. in retail for their entire life and and their family did as well and they weren't they weren't ready for it so she's got a little bit of insight into the world and that probably helped her out with the way she responded now Absolutely. she probably would have preferred not to be surprised the yeah. way she was <laughs> like I, I don't know if you know it would it, it would have been better for her if her dad had shown up at the house and broken yeah. the news a little more softly. Yeah. Um, but even the fact that she was surprised didn't, didn't break her. She's like right. you said, she's been a, she's been a warrior through this. And, yeah. You know, I, I've had the occasion to talk to her and she was, she's got a very good outlook about it. Mm-hmm. Um, she, she was dealing with it, coping with it in a healthy way. Uh, but if, if you refer back to episode two, we talked about how, how some of the spouses, including Kay, 
responded right. in, in the immediate aftermath. So I, I want to hear a little bit of like a direct insight into some of the conversations you had about your present and future. Right. <laughs> um, so she, she's not really uh, sheltered, as you said. I mean, it's, it's even, you know, I, I joke because um, just, just about stuff we talk about at work, like the brother thing or like the Mulan or like watch your six. So we, I was like a kid with her about that. And then, you know, I, I love my job. There's, there's nothing else that I would want to do that's anywhere close to this. I, I mean, I love, I love doing this job. Uh, of course we all complain, but it just comes with any, any kind of work. But, um, it went, when I got released and, you know, um, was home it started out almost as a joke. She was like, ah, you know, why don't you find something else you can do? Or, or why don't you do this? Or, you know, you don't have to go back to work. And then, you know. And then she's like, no, I'm serious. Right. And, it, and it, the first Wawa time. And it's, bonus. and it's it was hard, too, because I didn't want to hear that either. Sure. She's telling me that. So I was getting annoyed. And then a couple of times, because she's pregnant, it kind of scares me sometimes. I just kind of laughed it off. And it went on, I would say, for about two weeks where she's like, bringing up that same joke and then it turned into an argument mm. to where I was like I'm I'm not I'm not doing anything else I'm not quitting I'm not quitting my job I'm, I'm going back <laughs> I'm to not work leaving. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm going back to work and you know it turned into a huge fight and she ended up crying and then we ended up talking through it and it just it her real you know emotions were I don't want you to get hurt you know ne- sure. next time you go back to work the last time you left for work I saw you in the hospital when you go back to work I don't want that feeling again so right. and we were able to talk through that, which was something that kind of stuck out with me because at first I really thought she was joking, and then it was joking to 100% serious to an actual conversation of why I want to do this, the op, you know, weighing out options and stuff like that. And it, there was no option because right. honestly, I wasn't I wasn't not going to go back to work. I'm not I'm not doing something else. I don't want to. And they'll, they'll probably go through the same stages you go through, right? But but over a longer term, right? Like right. her. Her shock and disbelief were immediate, but but her longer term prospects, like the longer you stay right. at home, yeah, the harder it's going to be for her to watch you go back to work, right? And, and so that's something that I, I think she's done well with you. You know better than I do, and but that's you're going to have to jump that hurdle again when you get the call and they say, Officer Giles, you're cleared, right? You know, return to work. We're, we're expecting you on Monday, right? You get that call, you're going to have to have this conversation again, yeah. It was great, too, because uh, I have a really great friend uh, on the department, uh, Demiza, and um, we were classmates everything else like that, and he, he reached out to me a lot. Uh, we didn't really talk a lot, but, you know, he just reached out. But prior to the incident, we, I mean, we're very friendly, stuff like that, but since the incident, you know, he's just checking on me constantly, which I, I thought was amazing. And I was telling him about that, and he was like, it's pretty much the same thing you just said. She, she's going to have your home so much. You know, she doesn't want you leaving the house. Right. And then he gave me, you know, told me he was like, try, try doing like small trips. Like say, hey, I got to go out to like the park or like leave the house for like five minutes and then go from five to 30 minutes and then go from like three hours. And then we, I did that. I don't know if Kayla actually knew it, but I, I did it. And it, and it, it Sneaking really. Sneaking out in the middle of the night doesn't count. Why does he keep going to the helpful. park at yeah. 3 a.m.? <laughs> Never told I was getting milk, though. Yeah. <laughs> he left for cigarettes yeah. in 1984 and just came back. But that, that, uh, that honestly, like, it really worked because, you know, the first time me leaving by myself, it was, right. I think, I think we even fought about it. Wow. And then it went from that to, okay, she feels a little bit better to like, hey, I'm going to go out today. And she's like, oh, okay, see you later. Text me yeah. when you can, you know. Well, it, maybe that's, just, maybe that's the, the trick time. then. Like, yeah. the, don't tell her when you're scheduled to go back to work. Like, I'm going out and I'll be back <laughs> oh, in no. like 11 and a half no, hours. She, no, she will kill me. <laughs> <laughs> well, circling back a little bit to the to the announcement, how she found out. I, I think how a lot of people find out. It's, it, it seems different, but then we had talked prior um, that maybe that there's a course, and I'm going back to, uh, what was it, Ladder 49. They right. told the spouses that if you ever see the red car, right. the red you know, the red chief car, whatever it was, that comes to the house, you know it's not going to be good right. news. And so here she is finding out kind of accidentally, we'll say, there was no real fanfare with this. Right. What, and, I, and I'll ask both of you, because I don't know what it would be, you know, I, and, and we may talk about this. I may just be on the news <laughs> one day, you know, shrink has gone completely goofy, you know, we, and I said, it's always going to be something glorious, like, 
naked on the Wilmington Trust building, firing a high-powered rifle down at citizens. <laughs> you know, it it's going to be something. Go- no, and I'm kidding with that. If anybody's listening, that's only a fantasy. Anyway, uh, no. <laughs> but what what would be the proper announcement it, if if there is such a thing? And I, you know, and I don't know what would be the proper way to tell a spouse that your husband or your wife, let's be honest about that, has been shot in the line of duty. I'd I give it to the both of you. I, I honestly don't know. Um, the scene, um, my incident, it was so hectic. Um, I don't think there, there was time for a notification. Everybody was coming in to that right. scene. I, and I don't fault anybody for that. I've, I've had the conversation with a couple people who almost get like offended by it. And I'm like, what do you expect the department to do? That there was three almost three hundred officers on my incident. Like, I'd rather them go to work and handle with the incident. And not rather. In a perfect world, I would love, you know, for her or their other wives, um, I I can't even speak on them. Um, but at least for Kayla to be notified, but I understand that it's not practical all the time. Right. You just have to do what you have to do. I mean I think I think you had the right plan. Right. I think you, you found somebody that knows Kayla that trusts Kayla or that Kayla trusts right somebody who knows how to break the news to her right well in sort of a, a gentler way so I think you had the right plan and I think your plan just missed by what 10 minutes uh, it was like a minute a right minute. so you had the right plan I, I think that sending someone trusted like there's not a there's not a law enforcement spouse out there in general who knows or trusts the whole agency Right, right, but there are a couple platoon mates or there are a couple of shift mates or a couple of academy buddies that the spouses do know. And maybe having the notification done by someone who's known and who they're comfortable with right. is in a, in a lot of cases better right. than having someone, you know, show up in an unmarked car in a white shirt and knock on the door and, and do it in a very, you know, mechanical way. Right, right. Um, so I, I think it's it would be better to have it done by someone who's trusted and someone who's known. Um, and... and to Tyler's point, there's there's not always time for that. Right. There's not always – I was on that scene, full disclosure. And um, before I had a chance to get my phone out of my pocket, uh, the news had gone from that scene to the rest of the state and then to my wife, who's also on the job but was home, and she texted me, hey, I just heard from this trooper. Are you okay? From a trooper. <laughs> <laughs> I just heard from this trooper. Are you involved? Is this okay? Like it – Two degrees of separation in Delaware again, well, yeah. but sometimes there's not time to get the notifications done um, as as softly and as an appropriate way as we want. Right. But ideally, it would be done like that by someone trusted and known. Well, in all transparency, you know, I was texted by I think twelve different agencies. Did you hear what happened in Wilmington? And then my text to you was, "Hey, what's going on? What's going on?" And all of a sudden, it was, um, "Come now, Sism." needs here right <laughs> and and again you're right i you know and i just put it out there that i don't know i can't speak to having a, a proper way of of announcement but i like the idea of having a trusted inv- individual on the platoon um but in wrapping up this section because tyler's going to stick with us for our final section on current topics but i do i brought one in because we always have them standing here and i'll put that in front of the screen actually it's up i'll hold it like this I have a bottle of the Captain's Punch for Tyler. This is his. So the story behind this, obviously, we've talked about it. You can go to wagonhousewinery.com. You could go to uh, traumasurvivorsfoundation.org. But the Captain's Punch was, was made, created, in honor of Captain Alan Davis, our Chester police officer retired, who was shot in the line of duty. And we always talk about... You know, how tough he is, but how good of a guy he is. So when the, the wine was made, it's made out of a conquered grape. So it has the toughest skin, but the sweetest interior. That's awesome. Thank you. So you are now part of the <laughs> tough skin, sweet interior crowd. Awesome. Thank you. I'll have to show, I won't open it. I'll share it with the share, well, After the baby's the born. My God. Mommy needs juice too later. <laughs> <laughs> so Tyler's going to stick around. I want to thank Tyler for for being here, sharing his story, um, and again, thank you for your service, man. Honest to God, thank you, thank your family for for all that you've done for for the citizens of Delaware and just just in general because it we're in a time and a and an age that that you know. 
people in the first responder worlds aren't looked at as highly as they should be, but you guys are doing it, and I appreciate that. I know my family appreciates that, so thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. I mean, uh, like I spoke earlier, I mean, it's just been absolutely amazing. A, a lot of stuff gets said through the news, but once this incident happened, you know, it's just amazing how many people did so much for not only my family, but everyone else who was involved's family. It's been amazing, and I appreciate you guys letting me on. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thanks for listening to thecopintheshrink.com. We're going to be back with uh, some current events. Tyler's going to stick with us, and we're going to talk about a bunch of current topics. Cool. Thanks. You have seen their faces and read their stories. Our hospital heroes and first responders are remarkable. Their strength is inspiring as they continue to work around the clock in the fight against COVID-19. Throughout the pandemic, they have had limited downtime and limited access to prepared meals. Our hospital heroes are working in extremely stressful environments, literally placing their own safety at risk to help the sick and dying. Our mission is to show these frontline workers that we, the community they are caring for, supports and cares for them through the simple act of providing them with a prepared meal to help sustain them through the day. To complete this mission, We are partnering with local restaurants to deliver quality food directly to hospitals, urgent cares, testing centers, treatment centers, nursing facilities, and first responder stations. We have delivered nearly 25,000 meals to over 60 locations in Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland. We have been honored to help these amazing men and women. The meals we bring are met with such gratitude. In those moments, As the meals are set up, we see their gratitude in the form of tears and laughter. A simple meal can provide hope in the face of this terrifying disease. The Trauma Survivors Foundation's Hospital Heroes Food Drive has the incredible privilege of coming into the worlds of our hospital heroes and first responders at the most difficult time in their lives. For a $6 meal donation, you can help a hospital hero and a struggling restaurant stay focused and positive through the COVID-19 pandemic. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, but we still need your help to see our hospital heroes through this fight. Our heroes are why we do what we do, but you are the how. Your donation helps us provide food and hope to our frontline heroes. Your donation makes hope stronger than fear. Text Hospital Heroes to 44321 to donate a meal to a hero. Please visit us at hospitalheroesfooddrive.org to learn more about our mission. All right, welcome back to The Cop and the Shrink. Remember to follow us on thecopandtheshrink.com, on the interwebs with uh, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, And now, Harold Bozeman, actually on OnlyFans. So if you want to see an old guy with a dad bod, check out his OnlyFans. It's at dadbod.com. OnlyFans.com. Just kidding. Incidentally, that's completely not true. (laughs) (laughs) Not true. Not true. Again, we're back. Uh, We do have a special guest. We have uh, Tyler Giles. He's been sitting in this with the section. Welcome back with our current events. We are, as of right now, we're recording on September 12th. I made a posting on on my on my facebook uh and you could check that out you know we'll make that plug it's uh dennis Carradine jr out there you could you could check it out but i made a posting saying that i was a little taken aback is that a good thing taken aback taken aback that that i was looking at all the posts of people saying we will never forget we will remember september 11th 2001 and i stated that i know we will never forget September 11th, 2001, but most of us are forgetting September 12th, 2001. And and I put that out there, and we're going to put this up with current topics, because for September 12th, we all came together. We were patriotic. We all fought against the same enemy. We all cried for justice. We all sat and said, we now have a common enemy that came in to try to destroy the American way of life. I think we all got together. And if you can remember, one of, one of the things that absolutely broke my heart was that, that everyone got American flags. They were on their cars. They were stickers. They were, they were at their houses and so forth. And I forget when it was, but I started seeing small flags tattered on the ground. 
They were in trash cans, started seeing t- stickers fade. And then as that continued to go on, I started seeing the patriotism fade. 18 years goes by, and then we were hit by COVID-19. And I think patriotism then became something completely different. Tell me if I'm right or wrong. Tell me if I'm on the mark. Tell me if I am just blowing smoke. No, I think you're completely right. I think on September 12th, 2001, the country started to coalesce into something it hadn't been since probably since the World Wars. Right. Um, there, there was a sense of unity. There was a sense of let's let's pull back to the United States, protect the homeland, let's take care of one another, and let's let's unify against our common enemy. I think there was the sense of, like you said, the sense of patriotism. There were patriotic songs. There were flags everywhere. There was a sense of unity, mm-hmm. right? Even even for the most part, the politicians were by and large getting along, um, and. And like you said, over time, that did fade. But for a time, we had patriotic songs. We had presidents at baseball games. We had, oh. you know, we were on. We had flyovers at football games. We had the military out, you know, showing their showing their might, showing their, you know, their their precision and their tact. So we, we had this sense in this country where we should all come together. We, we've been attacked. We should pull in. We should come together um, and, and, you know approach the world like like a common unified people and right. like you said that that did fade um and here we are on september 12th 2021 and i don't think the nation's ever been more divided over what seems like every issue right it's and, and, and you're right. everything every issue is political and every issue is divisive right right we can't we can't agree on starbucks versus dunkin donuts we can't agree on wawa versus sheets uh, well, we can agree on everything. that. Oh, come on, that, that's one thing we can all agree on. Wah-wah. Everything is a divisive issue. <laughs> you know, you have Team A and Team B on almost every. There's no sense of unity anymore, and and it's almost as if people have pulled back into their own corners, and they they can't. We're not even able, as a people, to find common ground. Right. It's either my belief or your belief, and there's very little compromise going on anymore. Right. And and I think that's that's become a huge issue for our country our, as a whole. Well, it's not even, and I agree, it's not even compromise that's the issue. It's if you don't agree with me, you're completely wrong and you're evil. So I am going to lambast you every chance I get. I'm going to point at you and I'm going to tell you you're wrong and then I'm going to scream at you and then I'm going to go on the interwebs and I am going to completely decimate you and and literally just start this character assassination with it so I, now, so i think you've hit the nail on the head it's it's not even a matter of whether we disagree anymore right? right it's now it's a character assassination now it's if you don't agree with me you must hate x whatever the subject of the issue right, is right. if you don't agree with me you're hateful right you hate this you hate them you hate that whatever the issue is it's right so we we've, we've sort of assigned this sense this characteristics of, of hate to people simply for disagreeing with our opinion well, and, and our opinion is so subjective, it's crazy, right? You know, so if I sat here, you know, we joke around, we talk about Wawa and Sheets. You know, my daughter now, now a Penn State, Maine, you know, she, if, if we go up to visit, we have to bring 12 cartons of Penn State <laughs> or, or Penn State of Wawa iced tea because she hates Sheets up there. And, and we are a Wawa family. And she is not wrong. But, and she isn't. But if we go to Milroy, which anybody knows where Milroy is, God bless you. You go to Milroy and you say... You know, Wawa's better than Sheets, then you better duck. They might be firing stuff at you because of how built into that system is. Now, now again, and I'm not talking about just you be being behind somebody or whatever it is. Look, if you're if if you're a Phillies fan, you're a ravenous Phillies fan or an Eagles fan or whatever it is, and and that's great. I mean, you know, you throw you throw batteries at, at Santa, or whatever. <laughs> I don't, I, you know, that's your deal. We're not talking about this. We're talking about the fundamental difference between citizens of the same country. That if you don't agree with me, then I'm going to trash you every step of the way. And I I think this this practice of painting the opposite opinion or painting the opposition as evil, as somehow inherently damaging, uh, is is doing more harm than it. It's, It's really starting to hurt. The cohesion of the nation is starting to hurt the way the country functions because we don't just see it 
between me and the guy who prefers Royal Farms, right? Right. It's it's at the highest level. Oh levels. God, you just threw in Royal Farms too. <laughs> no, I, that that blows everything up here. <laughs> it, well, if you want chicken, Royal Farms, right? But it, we see it. It's not just interpersonal anymore. It's not just right. it's not just Sheets and Wawa. It's not just Dunkin' and Starbucks. Now we're seeing it at the highest levels of our government. We see the people who write our laws, who enforce our laws, who interpret our laws at every level. We see them painting the opposition as somehow evil right, and destructive right. and you know we can't even we can't even get laws written in this because we can't get any work done at the highest levels of our government because they're too busy assigning this characteristic of hate to one another to oh. to buckle down and do the work that they're there to do and that, the level of hypocrisy in that hate too so you know when you say one thing and then you're caught on camera saying that one thing and then you're caught on another camera saying something totally against what you just said. And then you defend what you said that you didn't say. I mean, both it's the times. hypocrisy. Both times? I think the uh, – sorry to interrupt. No, you. you're not interrupting but I think um, the, big, the big difference is, is September 12th, 2001, there's no social media. Oh, there's okay. no Facebook. There's no Instagram. There's no Twitter. So when that event happened, we didn't really know what um, – I was very young, um, but – we didn't know what other people were thinking, so I think everybody just wanted to band together and just come together. But now we we can get on our phones and see what your opinion is on this. What and then we can argue about it, and then you get met. It's just social media, which I get on all the time. It just I think it's ruining a lot. So so what you're saying here is is that us old bastards <laughs> <laughs> that we we had it right. No no, but no, I agree with you because now people are. Social media creates a faceless opinion, right. right? So if I put it out there and I argue with you and I say, Tyler, I don't like your political views. Right. And I put, and, and, and that's probably a light way of saying it, right? <laughs> you know, and I put it out there in the world, you know, I'm just this faceless guy behind a, a Facebook page or right. behind an Instagram page. But if we don't have that and we take that away, can now we start getting back together again? Yeah. Without... I don't, without social media, I don't think those conversations would be going on. I think it has destroyed productive debate, though. Yes. Right? It, people have got way too comfortable on social media saying things that they would never say right. across the table at lunch. Right. Like we can have lunch with one another and talk about some topics and talk about some current events, and we can disagree, and we can do it in a civil way. And we might even find that common ground. Like, right. this much of your opinion is right, this much of mine is right. There's, right. So there, this, this is our area of commonality. But people have gotten too comfortable behind the screen – under the protection of their keyboard with saying things that they wouldn't otherwise say to people. Right. And I think that's it's taken a lot of the civility out of the equation. It, it, a, a buddy of mine, I guess it was during the election, this past election, he, and he did, he's completely apolitical, but, he, but he's awesome how he did it. He, it within a 10-minute span, he just put up this red, white, and blue Trump. That's all it said. It was just Trump. 10 minutes later, he put up Biden. The comments... On both sides were just incredible. And he, he said nothing else. Just Trump and then Biden. Trump, there was like a thousand comments of, oh, rah, rah, you know, all this stuff. And then Biden, rah, rah, you know. And it just continues to go on and on and on. He said nothing. He said he didn't answer any of the comments. He didn't write anything else. He didn't come out and say, you know, I'm a registered Republican and I'm a, I'm a Trump supporter or he, nothing. And the beauty of that is, is that there's a tinderbox that I think is waiting in all of us that once something is said, we immediately have this reaction that I have to jump on you because if I don't, for some reason, I'm not going to be heard. There's also a crowd, too, on social media. If, if two people are having a conversation, like you said at the lunch table, it's you, too. Yeah. If it's two people having a conversation on social media, oh. there's millions of people looking at it. Your comic could go viral. Yeah, it's all three billion Facebook <laughs> yeah. users having that conversation with you. Right. Well, the, there was a story, you know, and we'll we'll put it out there. She has one of the largest followings on on social media. Kim Kardashian, she had put out, you know, something she was doing a little Facebook whatever it was or an Instagram live, and her daughter walks over and says, "Mommy, why do you talk differently when you talk to the <laughs> camera?" Right? And she goes, "I don't talk differently. How do I talk differently?" And then the, the little girl goes, you go, hey, everybody, and like completely changed her voice to kind of mock her mother. And and I was actually, I was impressed that Kim Kardashian allowed that to be leaked out there. Right. But that shows the power of it, is that people are changing 
who they are just for that audience, right? Well, let's talk about the Kardashian West family. Oh. <laughs> I don't think it's West family anymore, is it? It's Kim, Card- yeah, Kim's, yeah, yeah. Kim's then husband um, <laughs> expressed a political view, expressed a political opinion. He'd a huge Trumpster, right? And suddenly, suddenly, fully half of the people that ever supported him, bought his music, was a fan, abandoned him because he expressed a political opinion that they didn't right. agree with. Uh, it, and and that's not to say, you know, just because he thinks this way politically or he supports this candidate, it was the same artist. It was the same right. music. It was right. the same quality of work right, that he had always done. But I hate you now because you expressed a political opinion. It, it, it used to be, you know, when you were in your, your, your circles, and obviously Tyler being, being younger here, it used to be in the, the old circles is that you don't talk politics, you don't talk religion, you know, you, you have these taboo subjects that you don't discuss. And I think lately, and maybe, you know, and I, and I don't know, I think those taboo subjects, that fourth wall has been broken. That's all we talk about now. That's, I, right. And right. any conversation, any barbecue, anywhere you go, that's you know, politics. Politics, more than anything, is getting brought up at least once. It, do you think it gets more charged from a first responder standpoint? Do you think if we went, if we all went to a barbecue, right? I threw a barbecue at the house. And I had my police buddies, I had my fire buddies, I had my golf buddies, I have my business partners, and I threw them in there. Which group is going to get the most charged politically? So uh, I'll tell you the answer, and then I'll tell you why. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> the, first, the first responders are going to be the most vocal and the most dug into whatever their position happens to be. And the reason why is the Taking, taking volunteers aside, the vast majority of all first responders in this country are government employees. So politics affects our job. Right. Politics affects who gets appointed to be our chief. Politics affect what direction our department takes regarding policy matters and, and community matters and stuff for a given term of some politician. Politics affects our jobs directly, and we either agree with the politics of the time or we don't. But either way, we're going to be super vocal about our position right. and super dug into our position, right? Because we, we either, we, you know, we support the politicians who support us. Right, right. Or right. the politicians that don't support us must be evil, evil. and hateful. <laughs> right. So, and, and I'm telling you, that's the reason why is the vast majority of us are government employees and politics are directly related to our jobs. I, I don't disagree with that. Don't disagree. Would... Do you think, and I, and I put that based in patriotism, okay, let's throw that out, okay, we talk politics, but now patriotism, we go to that same barbecue, we have those different groups, police, firefighters, we have, we have a group of golf guys over here, we have, we have bankers over here, we have healthcare workers, because literally this is what our barbecue is going to look like, right? We're going to have all these different groups, and then we throw in patriotism. Who's saying what? I think it honestly depends on the age group too. A lot of adults now weren't alive or can even remember September 11th. So they didn't really necessarily live through that. So having a conversation with, you know, somebody even my age who remembers it, but wasn't old enough to do anything. I wasn't old enough to, you know, do anything. Um, Barely old enough to care. Correct. (laughs) So having a conversation with somebody who, whether they were in New York City that day, whether they're a first responder or whether they're just a civilian. It was on the news for two months straight. Everybody remembers it, except for a lot of our adults now, 18-year-olds. You know, they don't – they have nothing involved in that necessarily because it didn't really affect them. Right. Well, we, we made mention of that during our first episode that a lot of the young men and women that um, are still protecting parts of the Middle East or the, that were just withdrawn from Afghanistan right. were there fighting a war that was – precipitated by an event they weren't alive for. Correct. Right. So, and, well, and we said so that the 13 that, that died in the last days, you know, the 13 that died that came home here to, to Delaware, came to Dover, none of them, none of them were alive when the actual event happened, September 11th happened. Right. They were between 18 and 20 years old. And, and, and the reality, maybe the oldest one was alive when it happened, but yet the, the reality is that they're fighting a war that they didn't have a conscious reality of what happened. They don't remember all the cars driving around with the flags hanging or right. just the camaraderie of just between regular people, regardless of first responders or not, just people, 
Like, mm-hmm. I, re- I remember that. Just, you know, my dad walking down the street and talking to people that he didn't even – they would walk by the house every day, but they never had a conversation. And then once that happened, it was almost every day. He was talking to everybody. So they don't necessarily remember that going on. They, they can't remember all the cars flying the flags and patriotism and stuff like that. I thought it was uh, cool today, you know, watching, you know, football tonight. Uh, two teams, you know, one was supporting FDNY and one had an NYPD sh- uh, hat on, which uh, especially now with sports – yeah. To see somebody supporting the police department um, was, is just crazy. So just, just having that come back for, you know, even today for September 12th, just right. having a football team support, you know, regardless of what's going on now, just supporting things that happened that day is it's still crazy. Just to say something that we remember, but right. let's remember September 12th versus just remembering September 11th. What was it? Was it Alan Jackson, right? Where were you when the, the where the world stopped turning? Was that it? That song? And then Toby Keith I, came out I with it. Toby Keith. <laughs> Toby Keith came out with it. Kick the uh, red, white, and blue, or what it? I, there was patriotism. There was there was a sense of hey, and then you would hear this blasting, and people were like, yeah, I don't even like country music. Right. Shit, this is great. <laughs> you know, and and now it's like, eh. So really, man. and and sadly, what. What the trend has been for the last five or six years or so, I suppose, is it's becoming really popular, right? It's the popular position to take that maybe maybe patriotism isn't all good, and and when was America ever great? And and opinions like that, like, so people are being actively taught to to not be patriotic or to question what patriotism is and what it means. Um, and and I think that the takeaway, and it's it's something I've always heard, is that true patriotism. True patriotism is loving your country and your countrymen and not necessarily your government, right? Our right. government is not the be-all and end-all yeah. of our existence, and neither are the positions politically of the people in the government. Right. Right? We can still come together as people, as human beings, out from behind our computer keyboards and be patriotic and love our country and what it means and the opportunities it has given people. Right. Um, and especially the people who are crowing the loudest about how our, our country – has never been great, or enjoying the greatest benefits of living right, in this country. Right, right. I, you know, if, if some of this stuff was actually said in certain countries around the world, and and I would never put anybody in that position because obviously we we do live in one of the greatest countries of of of, of the world. But if you're if you came out and you showed opposition to to government in in a lot of countries, you're in for a very bad day. How, right. We can openly give the finger to our president here, and not have a threat of being killed. How long do you think Peter Ducey would last at a at a uh, at a press conference with Kim? <laughs> right? Would they throw the mortar right there at him? <laughs> I mean, honestly, God, it, it's it's amazing to me how we will thumb our nose and stick our finger up to a government that allows us to do that. That's always been amazing to me. You know, it's sometimes it's it's crushing to see people to spit on it and understand that they're allowed to spit on it because our our nation allows that. You know, but that's why we are. And I I had to have somebody ex- explain that to me because I got you know like angry uh, a couple of years when the trend came when you know the the athletes were kneeling during the anthem. I remember sitting and I I think it was even my cousin. Uh, just complaining about it. And he's like, you know why we're so great? Because that person can do that. Right. We have the right to kneel. There's the, you know, our servicemen are going, you know, fighting these wars so that you have that right to express your opinion. Kneel. Right. That's that that's their right to kneel. And that, ever since then it's I kind of been like, you know what, you're right. right. And you it's can, also our right to not like it. You right. can agree with yeah. it or disagree with it, but it's you know, everyone's right to express themselves. Correct. Ha. <laughs> We need to play some Toby Keith. We just got all <laughs> hyped up for this. So, so we're going to go a little long with this section. We're, I've, I've decided. I've made, damn it, I've made the executive decision. We're going to because we got another current event. We, we went a little long with patriotism. Not that we went long with patriotism. We talked about it. It's, a, it's a good event. I wanted to throw in briefly before we wrap up completely. Um, I just heard that the Capitol Police. There's six Capitol Police officers that are put up for disciplinary charges based on the insurrection on January 6th, saying that they were not, how can I put it, they they were not holding themselves to the moral standards of the Capitol Police during the insurrection. And one of the moral standards was 
is that they were caught cursing out the thousands of insurgents that were rushing the Capitol. And, and dare I say the word, because I hate the word, but I will say it, in an unprecedented event that didn't happen since the burning of the Capitol in, what, 1861? We have never had that happen since, or before, or after. Here comes this insurgents. Thousands of people are rushing into the Capitol building. Thousands of people are coming in. And dare one of those Capitol officers tell somebody to F off. I don't like it. I don't like it. You don't have to. I know. That's that's why I'm a patriot. <laughs> that's why this country is great. You don't have to like it. But to, to be honest with you, that is not that is not unheard of. Um, I don't know what was said or to whom it was said. He used the F word. By those police officers. <laughs> um, I don't. I wasn't there, living their experience. I don't know what the context was or or how they felt. Most importantly, I don't know how they were feeling at that time. What I do know is it's not uncommon for police departments to have some standards in place in their policies and procedures that dictate the way police officers speak to people and address address people and the language that's used in public. Um, when you're working as an agent of the government, when you're working for the government, um, there are there are some restraints on the First Amendment that the general public doesn't experience. But right. but as agents of the government and, and very visible uniformed representatives of that arm of the government, uh, pretty frequently police agencies and law enforcement agencies do put prohibitions on the things you can say and the ways you can say them. So it's not it's not unheard of. It's I, not I understand your position of. is that you you know, given the context, there there are thirty thousand people outside and there's a glass door between me and them holy fuck, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, th- you're going to utter something that maybe wouldn't in other circumstances be appropriate, but maybe was it completely inappropriate that day? I, see, and that's what I have an issue with. If it's, if it's conduct unbecoming and you're not holding yourself to a moral standard, and again, you have these people rushing in and, and you yell something to them, I think, A, there, there's a human factor in this. Right. Because I'm sorry, I, you know, I was not there, obviously, nor nor has the FBI checked me on Facebook to say I was there, but I wasn't there. But my thought is, call me crazy with this. If I see a bunch of angry rioters coming at me and again, that plexiglass, that glass shield is right there and they're coming at me and their hands are up and somebody's yelling they have a gun or kill this cop or go after him or take them out or try to do whatever, I think bare minimum, I, I probably won't yell, well, oh, gosh darn it, guys, don't come in here. No, no, I'm going to be professional. I am going to, and I, you know, excuse the language, I'm motherfucking them sideways. So it's interesting that there are studies that have been done, um, and especially in the world of, of body cameras becoming more prolific, uh, there are studies that have been done about how police speak to people, like in the heat of the moment. Um, and the most common phrase uttered by police that could be considered offensive in some way is show me your effing hands or get on the effing ground. And it's it, the studies that have been done have shown that that's for emphasis, right? That That's like, right. I'm serious. Please, please lie down. Please let me see your palms. Isn't right. effective. <laughs> so for emphasis sake, in the heat of the right. moment, that's what gets that's what gets uttered. So the studies were done to to sort of support the officers in the position they maybe shouldn't be disciplined for right. shouting something like that at a moment such as this. Right. Right. So so I I do agree with the standards of conduct. I do agree with, you know, how officers should comport themselves right. and, and how people that we serve deserve to be spoken to. I agree with that. Right. But I also agree that it, it th- there's got to be context. Context is important. I think, okay, so I'm going to put it to our young officer. I'm putting it to Tyler. I can tell you for a fact, Tyler <laughs> uses the F word. On, on a frequent basis. He's been great on the and air. <laughs> He's been awesome today. So here's 30,000 rioters coming at you. And they're targeting you. They're, you, have to, you have to save senators. You have to save the people behind you. This is your job. It's you. And we've said it. This is like you're the Praetorian Guard right now. You are, are in the middle of all this chaos. You're like Scott Pilgrim. <laughs> you are Scott Pilgrim at all this. Are you using the F word? 
Uh, yes. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it just, and repeatedly. Correct. After I was shot, I think I said it twelve times. I think it's on. You know, I, I, I said it a on lot. On body cam. <laughs> right. Um, and like you know, um, Bozeman said, it depends on the situation. Um, it's almost. It was explained to me a long time ago. I, it maybe even in the academy. It's what you're trying to portray. You know, some situations don't dictate that language, but you know, cussing or uh, saying fuck or anything like that, you know, to a resisting or a resisting felon. Right. They, um, and just from my experience, they kind of get your point more. Right. It's like, uh, listen, like uh, we're supposed to act like this and be professional, but you're resisting. This is a dangerous situation. You know, sometimes you have to go to that level and, just from my experience, 90% of the time it works. And let's be completely frank. We're not saying the F word to people who are not themselves very comfortable with Correct. the F word. <laughs> Correct. Right? We're not knocking on the door for like a check on the welfare. Granny, hey, how the F are you? We're not yes. doing that, Correct. right? It's not, it, context matters. Yes. I, I, I want that to happen. <laughs> well, come on, look at it. We emphasize it all the time. I mean, when, when I'm working with a patient, you know, obviously the appropriate nature. And we, and, and, and we talk about moral standards. Now, a lot and so of your forth. patients are cops, so it's still a lot of minor <laughs> cops. It's still and, appropriate for you to swear at them. Well, but when they are in that moment for me to be buttoned up, and I, I had said this to one of, one of my officers that sees me, that, you know, for 13 years of my career, I was coat and tie every single day, coat and tie every single day. And then I had I had an officer that came in to see me. He was, he was a higher level officer. And, and he came in and he looked at me and he said, um, yeah. 86, the coat and tie. And I was like, why? And he goes, I'll tell you right now, it makes me feel like I'm going to the principal's office right. or it makes me feel, and, and I never real. I thought I was being the professional. I thought I was being that, that here I am. I'm, I'm the therapist. I'm the professional. I will dress uh, accordingly and so forth. I didn't understand the barrier. And the barrier was, is that it was harder for people to discuss things with me based on that buttoned up appearance. So, you know, the, the dress goes casual and so forth. But what I also found out is if there's a common language between us, that if, if dropping the F-bomb is dropping the F-bomb, then we do that. And then that makes somebody even more comfortable with me to be able to discuss that. Right. And most of the time, you're not, you're, you're, you're not making it a game and you're not trying to put the F-bomb in, in a uh, sentence with only 20 sec, uh, 26 words and each every other one is going to be the F-bomb. You're trying to say to emphasize how you felt. And well, how, I don't, how I don't you want to shatter it. anyone's image of first responders, but I <laughs> promise you that when we're talking amongst ourselves, even between groups, cops and cops, cops and firefighters, cops and nurses, it's sometimes the conversations get to the point where the F word is almost like a comma. Right. Yeah. Right? <laughs> what, did, what did SpongeBob say? Sentence enhancers? Sentence They're enhancers. Sentence enhancers. Sentence and enhancers. And so, like, in, in your position, you're right. It, it's It wouldn't be out of bounds for you to, to, to get on that level and just right. have a frank discussion. It's, you're not going to hurt anybody's feelings, right? It's not. Yeah. But if I did that with, and we go back, and we always use the bank. I feel bad. We always use the bankers as that, uh, as that <laughs> other side of things, right? You <laughs> I got to tell you, though, Mama at PNC, Oh, oh, oh. Mama wouldn't have minded you dropping an F-bomb. Mama, time, mama time. loved me. She she would not have minded if if, if her baby Dennis had, uh, had said a couple of F-bombs, especially at Quincy. But that's a whole story for a different episode. But we'll use that banker. If I sat down with somebody and walked in and you had somebody that worked at whatever the banks here in Delaware, and I walked in, the first thing I said, how the F are you? You know, that right. might be the last session I have with them. Yeah, you're not going to open a, a, a bank robbery debriefing like that. Yeah, you can't. You but can't. you could walk into a police debriefing and say, how the F's everybody doing? Yeah, and they would they would actually respect it. it it's such Probably a bizarre thing. better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tyler's like, just F it up, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I, it depends on your audience, too. It depends on... Mm -hmm. You know, if if I'm at work and I'm talking to someone who's like the similar age age as me, um, I even went to because, uh, like I said, I grew up, um, you know, in in the city. Um, I interact with people who I even you know went to high school with. So right. I, if I know you and you're in like my um, age range, circle of right. trust, right? In not well, not no, not not even circle <laughs> of trust, but just you know, a, a citizen just talking to me. Right. We're just having a frank conversation. So, I mean, sometimes we cuss. I think it depends on what's going on. I mean, th there has to be some kind of accountability because right. we are 100% held to a higher standard. And 
out of context or without having no explanation to just degrading or talk to, talking to somebody, should there, there should be disciplinary actions. But if I'm chasing after somebody who has a gun and I say fuck or yeah. something like that, I think that that should be okay. I think you, you need to yell, put the fudging, yeah. the, the monkey-loving <laughs> right. gun right. down. Is that, you know? Right. I, I don't know. I, I go back to it. It's that, that moral standard or conduct on becoming that I guess I have that issue with. But what's it, the punishment? Well, the punishment in this is termination. And I think that's absurd. You're, for, you're, for, for you're their... losing your job because in the heat of a moment with 30,000, you know, insurrectionists coming at you, you had harsh language. And, and I think that's with, with, if we look at just common, you know, music, we look at our, our lives right now. What is it? It used to be, is it, what, what's it called? Safe Harbor? After 10 o'clock, you know, that, that uh, TV can play, you know, harsher words. Right, and, you can show butt cheeks and say shit on yeah, TV yeah. after 10 o'clock. And that started with NYPD Blue. Mm-hmm. You know, was it Sipowitz? We saw Sipowitz's <laughs> butt, you know, and, and whatever it is. And that was after 10 o'clock. Now... And of all mid- the butts on NYPD Blue, we, we didn't Andy's was the last Sipowitz. one we needed to see. <laughs> but now we have a situation. You're 5 o'clock, and they're they're throwing out those seven deadly words of, of George Carlin. And... And so we're holding police officers to a standard that society doesn't hold themselves to. Look at Cardi B, for God's sakes. You know, her that her latest, well, I, I don't know if it's the latest. Apparently she has a, a second child, which I hope those kids are very, very impressed by her WAP uh, song. <laughs> and we won't talk about what it is, but the reality is, is that became an ultra popular song in our culture. And, and it's a very explicit song. And so, okay, are we just holding police to a standard that they shouldn't be held to, or first responders to a standard? And, and really, who who are our heroes, right? Cardi B is one of the most popular, for some reason, artists Artist. in the country. She's she's popular. She's she sells well. She's making a million bucks on this stuff. She is an admitted drug user, drug dealer, rapist, and robber. Admittedly, right, right. and. And her hero status among the people who hold her to that level hasn't dwindled at all. None. So who who are who are we making heroes of? Right? We're we're vilifying the cop who said, Who the F are these people? Right. But but we have somebody who's an admitted rapist and armed robber and she's a hero to so many young people who right. shouldn't even be exposed to her shenanigans. Why can't we just go back to early nineties hip hop? <laughs> she <laughs> was so much better. Third base God, come on, man. God, you know, we could go back. I Even Wu-Tang was was pretty awesome, you know? Come on, let's go back to that stuff. This, no, I'm kidding. Well, that's a whole other debate to things. It's an, it, it, as an aside, I've, I've got my daughter listening to the Beastie Boys and Run DMC, and she loves it. Perfect. 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 Tyler's going, I, I don't even know who that was. <laughs> what was your first CD, Tyler? What was the first CD you ever got? I think, honestly, it was... Well, the first, I had a Walkman, and then the first thing my parents got me were the Men in Black cassette that I had. <laughs> and then... Well, Will I Smith, don't... man, who wouldn't get jiggy with it? Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. At some point in my life, I snuck a Two Live Crew cassette into my Walkman and threw the case away. That was controversial to an unreal level back then, and now it's it's commonplace. Now they, now they play it on the morning show. And it's the way it is. So... In, in, in retrospect, and to, and to summarize everything, is that we should use the words for emphasis. We should use those sentence enhancers. But you have to watch your back because ultimately you might get put up to a moral moral standard issue. And, and, and I think I you should, though. Should, I agree that there should be standards on how public servants address people. Yes. But the standards should apply to which people the public servants are addressing as well and, right. and what their behavior has been up to the point where they're addressed by us. And the situation. Pulling over grandmom and telling her to give you Slow the F down, Granny. Give me your effing documents, you know. There there are are cops like that. Right, right. And and they give us all the consequences of that. And and 100% they should. But, you know, we should never do that to a firefighter that says, we're going to burn (laughs) this effing place down. No, no, no. So, (laughs) Tyler, thank you again for being here. And, and Harold asked the question, who's my hero? You guys are my hero. I, I have always contended the first responders and, and me being a part of it, me being a, a volunteer for as many years as I did, 
you know, I, I still look up to the first responders in my world. I wouldn't do my job if I didn't believe that, that, that they were a part of a greater good, you know. But if Cardi B wants to pay me to be her private therapist, <laughs> I'm going. She, she but no, use, I'm kidding. She, she can Whatever. use the help. She needs the help. So the, remember, this is the Cop and the Shrink. Go to us at copandtheshrink.com. You can also find, hey, we were just talking about it. This is our cowboy blend for those that are looking at the uh, Survivors Beverage Company. You can go to drinksurvivors.com. Get your delicious fix of caffeine. We even have K-Cups. We, we are so modern. We have K-Cups. A lot of K-Cups. Uh, you could, again, Wagon House Winery and... October 9th, go to DelawareBeerFest.com, and you're going to check out that we are bringing Survivor's IPA into the Delaware market. Nice. Very exciting with it. Remember, all proceeds from any of the beverages that we have go to the Hospital Heroes Food Drive. We are looking at getting ourselves a food truck, and Tyler is going to drive it for us. If you don't Indeed. want me driving. While he is cussing up a storm, telling people <laughs> to get their effing sandwiches. Uh, well this is the end of our episode again thanks a lot uh stay well out there be patriotic remember september 12th and uh we love you talk soon